first textbook printed in America was used to teach reading and Bible lessons. The McGuffey readers in there, the children modeled in there, were prompt, good, kind, honest, and truthful, that taught students morals based on the Bible. A far cry from what we see in the media today. In 1865, Congress approved the model, In God We Trust, our coins. We continue to see our heritage. The words, In God We Trust, are inscribed in the House and Senate chambers, and then they go about ignoring those very words. On the walls of the Capitol Dome, we hear the words, The New Testament, according to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Liberty Bell, we see the words from Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 10, inscribed. On the middle chapter of the Washington Bible, the words, Praise be to God. In the Lake Memorial, we find the words, God, Bible, the Almighty, and Divine Attributes. The Jefferson Memorial includes the words, God who gave us life, gave us liberty. So the question is, was the Bible instrumental in the foundation of this country? Absolutely. It's on our monuments and it's in some of our documents. Matter of fact, the Bible was the only religion book that was used as part of the foundation of this country. So we have a biblical heritage in America. So let's go into the situation part two now for our briefing. What is our present situation? J. Lucas, senior pastor of Grace Community Church, in his book, Ask Them Why, he makes a statement I've heard from many, many youth and parents. If only I had known what I know now, if someone had taught me how to defend my beliefs, I would have had the courage to speak up. Folks, we're sending our youth off to the public school systems, off to the secular universities and colleges, and they're not prepared for this. We're sending them to a battlefield, and we're not training them. So the question is, how many of you would go to the Afghanistan battlefield dressed as you are today? You wouldn't. So why are we so willing to sacrifice our youth without preparing them? That's the strong question. Three independent studies. Let me show you what's happened. Because we haven't trained our youth. Oh, but why they go to Sunday school? That's right, we didn't go to Sunday school. But they don't get trained in Sunday school. What do you mean they don't get trained? I've been to a lot of, a lot of churches and seen the high school Sunday school, the junior high Sunday school. They get maybe 10 to 15 minutes of teaching out of the Bible, some kind of a lesson. Then what they get is a lot of entertainment, fun, Let me show you three independent studies. One done by Answers in Genesis American Research Group. One done by Barbara, one done by the Nehemiah Institute. All three of these groups did independent studies, independent surveys, and all three of them came up with the same conclusion that over 70% of our youth were leaving the church before they finished school. Think of that. 70% of the Christian students in Redmond, Bellevue, and Kirkland will stop attending church before they finish school. That is the national norm right now. That's pretty scary, isn't it? 70%. Let me show you the results of the EMI Institute. They did a nationwide survey. They did it twice, about almost 20 years apart. Now, the three boxes you see, the blue box on the bottom, were Christian students who attend public schools. The green box in the middle are Christian students who attend what we call traditional Christian schools. And the yellow box on the far right are Christian students who attend what we call biblical worldview schools, Christian schools. Those are the Christian schools that actually have courses in apologetics, meaning they're actually training their students how to defend their faith. The sad part about that is that's about 6% of the Christian schools in this country. That's sad. Means the other 94% aren't training their students how to defend their faith. Let me show the results of this study. First one done in 1988. 36% of the Christians had a biblical worldview that attended public schools. 47% that attended traditional Christian schools, but 61% that attended biblical worldview schools. Then they redid the study again in 2009. And here are the tragic results of doing nothing. Today, only 4% of our Christian students that attend public schools have a biblical worldview. But even more tragic is only 15% of the Christian students attending Christian schools have a biblical worldview. But look at the last one. Of those Christian schools that actually train the students how to defend their faith, 
Train the students that there are real answers in the Bible. Train them on how to get into a scientific discussion. Train them on critical thinking skills and logic. 74% have a bit of worldview. Because they see the Bible as reality. It's not the Bible over here and the world over here. They go together very well. So armies and nurseries. I tend to do a lot of the military here. What Marines do. The training do. Armies and nurseries. What's the difference? Well, an army is where you have a group of people gathered together to fight for a common cause for victory. That's an army. So what's a nursery? That's where people go to get fed and entertained. <coughs> Which one are we in? An army or a nursery? So let's keep that one in mind. Textbooks, America's Foundation. Let's talk about that part. Dr. Paul Vitt, university professor, did a study in 1983. Went through many, many different textbooks. 60 social studies textbooks, 640 stories in elementary reading books. To find out what was in these books or, or what was not in these books. And here's his conclusion. Take it all together, these results make it clear that the public school textbooks exclude the history, heritage, beliefs, and values of millions of Americans. Those who believe in free enterprise are not represented. Those who believe in the traditional family are not represented. And those who are committed to their religious traditions, at least part of the struggle record, are not represented. Right? Parents, public school and rights. Parents, you know your rights when it comes to schools. Melinda Harmon, Texas Federal District Judge, 1996. Parents give up their rights when they drop children off at the public school. Parents know that? Now, this is a generalization. Be careful. Not all public schools are like this. I went to some that are not like this. But this is the same. Dr. Robert Cremini, Executive Director of the Pennsylvania School Council Association, a letter to Penn State House of Representatives, 1997. The idea that parents know what is best for their children is a flawed concept at best. This is what's integrated. This is what's getting into the school systems now. This is what they're heading for. So let's go to college. Anybody want to go to college? You're already. What, you in college yet? Let's be ready to go to college. Let's go to college. <laughs> what they teach at secular universities, and unfortunately, many Christian universities, is evolution is a fact. Which means man is the measure of all things. So what is evolution then? Let's figure that out. What is evolution? It encompasses a world view. It's the ideology that there is no greater God. Evolution is based on what we call, the foundation for it is called materialism. That is the ideology that all that exists is mass and energy. Which means there's no supernatural forces, no God of any kind. That is the basic foundation of evolution right there. Abby and I. In your book, Fish Out of Water. Now, I like this book. You can get it from Answers in Genesis. I don't sell it, but Answers in Genesis does. It's a wake up call. If you're getting ready to go to college, this book, folks, is a wake up call. I thought I was well prepared for college. The first shock I received on arriving on campus was freshman <coughs> orientation, which you should know now, right now, is a terrible misnomer. And I'm going to back up exactly what she says here, because I've been in these universities and I've spoken to the students. And she continues. The correct term would be fresh indoctrination. Many schools basically hold students hostage for the first three or four days and attempt to reprogram their brains on matters of moral relativism, tolerance, gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever rights, postmodernism, new age spirituality, and savvy substance abuse. In other words, before our students even attend the first class in college, we lose them. Because they're not prepared for this. They're simply not prepared for what's going to happen. Welcome week message. You will be part of a group. I'm going to let you know you really don't have to be part of a group. But the pressure is great to become part of a group. Because think of this. This is the first time your Johnny or Susie's been away from home this long. And they don't want to be a standout along there. They want to be part of a group. So it seems nice 
if we can become part of a group. And they almost make it sound like it's mandatory, but it is not mandatory to become part of the group. You will think like the group. Check your outdated religious beliefs at the door. Homosexuality is normal, and everyone drinks and has premarital sex. There's your so-called orientation week for many universities. This is where we send our Christian students, many of them. Northern Arizona University, freshman honors class. Now, let me give you a book here, the man who wrote this book, Chris Hedges, graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? it sounds very good. Here's his book, American Fascist, the Christian Right, and the War on America. This was required reading in the freshman honors class at Northern Arizona University. Now let me give you some quotes from this book. Followers, being evangelical Christians in the movement, are locked within closed systems of information and indoctrination that cater to their hates and prejudices. Then he goes on. Most of America's fundamentalist and evangelical churches are led by pastors who peddle this non-reality belief system, one that embraces magic, the fiction of a Christian nation. This was required reading at Northern Arizona University, freshman honors class. Now, let me show you talking to these students. A comment from a student who attended this class. I didn't know Christians were so bad. Now, let me show you comment coming from this girl's mother. This is the mother of that student. Don't Christians realize what their children will be up against? And if they do, why aren't they preparing their children for these times? This mother lost her child. Not physically, but spiritually. 70% of Christian students are leaving the church today. Because they're not being trained how to defend their faith. So science, philosophy, or faith in the classroom. Which one is it? Are we really being trained in science, or is it someone's philosophy? Well, most of these universities teach evolution. They teach it as a fact. And today, in certain states in this country, at high school, it is demanded and stated as a law, you will teach evolution as a fact. So evolution is being taught. They're learning all about this thing called the Big Bang Explosion. Now, don't think of this as a dynamite explosion. That's not what's taught. What the Big Bang is, is a hot fireball, an expansion of space and time. And from this Big Bang came all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, and all life. But what they're not being taught is to ask basic questions like, where did the matter come from to break this Big Bang? Because, folks, you cannot have something go back until you have something that can go back. And that is a perfectly legitimate, qualified question. It should be allowed to be asked in the classroom. Where did that come from? Or what caused it to explode? Those are perfectly good questions. And they can't be answered, let's put it down, but we don't know. And this whole idea is not a fact. And it can't qualify as a theory, folks. In science, a theory has to be repeatable, observable. No one ever saw this, and it can't be repeated. And there's so many missing answers, such as, where's the whole missing answer? Oh, man, are you talking about science fiction? No. Every time energy is converted into, man, into matter, there's equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Guess what we can't find in this universe? Most of all, we can't do matter. Which is a major problem for the Big Bang. There's not enough supernovas. As a matter of fact, we look at the supernovas when a star collapses in and explodes. We look at our galaxy alone. There's enough observed supernovas to equate to an age of just a little over 6,000 years. We can't find enough supernovas to equate for a large, long universe, old universe. The existence of comets is a great problem. Because every time they go around the solar system, they lose some of the mass. So we, they, there's some inventions in there. Oh, we, we have a, a Kuiper Belt out there. But that, and there is a Kuiper Belt of objects out around Neptune. But they're all so large. If they were to come out of there and become a comet circling around, it would be a spectacular event. Most are about ten times in size too large. So that doesn't work. So now they invent some called an ore cloud that's so far out there nobody can see. It's called a rescue mechanism. If we don't have the evidence, we'll invent something. And sometimes the rescue mechanisms can be okay. But folks, there's absolutely zero observational evidence for this. There's this cloud that's a cloud of objects so far out 
something nobody can see called our cloud. And every once in a while, one of these objects comes out of there and becomes a comet going around our solar system. There's zero observational evidence for that. But the fact that these comets are here can also be interpreted as good evidence. Our solar system is not that old. Stars. No one's ever seen a star form. No one's ever seen a star form. And based on what we know about physics, they won't form. See, we're normally taught that we get these great big gas and dust clouds called nebula. They rotate around and around and around. And as they do so, they begin to gravitation and touch inward and basically form a star. Folks, that is absolute, and here's your technical term, baloney. Because you can take physics 101, go to the chapter on heat pressure, which we can measure, because as those nebula clouds do rotate around, and they will begin to gravitate and touch inward, but as they do so, they generate heat pressure, and we can measure this. The heat pressure is always stronger than the gravity, will always cause that cloud to expand outward. Then there's other problems with the magnetic field that says it won't collapse. But see, we're not being taught that. The galaxy, we're saying the galaxies, there's no known physics that says how these galaxies form. There's only speculation. And we need the label of that speculation, folks. What they're teaching in schools today is evolution and not science anymore. We need to get back to teaching good science in our classrooms. Whether it refutes evolution or seems to support evolution, we need to teach science. They talk about the origin of life. About three and a half billion years ago, through nothing but naturalistic processes, life evolved. But what they're not teaching is that whole idea of the origin of life is 100% speculation. Scientists, our best scientists can't even create a single protein by random chance. Not even a single protein, let alone things like the DNA, the RNA, the organelle, the ribosomes. Does that get anybody excited when I say terms like that? They get you excited. Don't you excited when you hear things like that? What about this? One cell, we have about 60 trillion of these in your body. One cell is more complex than any machine man has ever made. They don't talk about things like that. They don't talk about that life cannot start in the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere. Because oxygen, we need to survive, but oxygen blood level destroys the chemical bonds. They don't teach that life could have never started if there was no oxygen. Because if there's no oxygen, there's no ozone. And the ultraviolet rays of the sun will come down and quiet again. So if there was oxygen, life can't start. If there was oxygen, no oxygen, life can't start. And then they don't teach that life can't start in water. They give this indication implying that life started way down deep in the oceans, folks. Anybody that's taken chemistry, just 101, knows water is one of the worst places in the universe for life to begin. Because at the molecular level, there's a process called hydrolysis. Hydro meaning water. Hydrolysis means water splitting. Within a matter of weeks, all these chemical bonds would have been destroyed. So life can't start on land with or without oxygen. It can't start with water. And then they don't talk about things like probability. See, life is made up of all your biological proteins are made of 100 percent left-handed amino acids. But the natural tendency is always to bond left and right. Every experiment we've ever done ends up with almost an even mixture of 50 percent of each. They don't talk about things like that. What they are teaching is evolution. We've got to get back to teaching good science in our classrooms. They talk about DNA. And they teach a lot of good things about DNA. A lot of good things about DNA. But what they're not talking about, the information in a single DNA molecule, in one single DNA molecule, is over 5 billion times more compact than a 300 gigabyte hard drive. Far beyond anything mankind can do. And that figure 5 billion has now been up closer to 10 billion because of what was discovered the last couple of years. They don't talk about information always requires an intelligent center. No one has ever come up with a factual example of information derived from natural processes. It always requires an intelligent center. They don't talk about things like that, but they do teach us evolution. They talk about mutations, and mutations are very real. And we know that. How do you know that, Mike? It's easy. Just look at the person next to you. You can well look at it. Yeah. I noticed they both looked at you. That's all. Mutations are very real. But what they don't talk about, Better, greater than 99.9% .9 of all known mutations are detrimental or neutral. That doesn't leave much for beneficial, does it? Doesn't leave much. And mutations have never been shown to add new functional genetic information. They have a tendency to cause loss of functionality. A 
again, teaching evolution, but not science. They talk about dinosaurs. Well, a lot about dinosaurs. But they don't teach, they ask questions like, where did dinosaurs come from? I've been to museums all over this planet. I've gone through a lot of books. Why do I see dinosaurs? What am I not seeing? All the thousands of transitions that led up to the dinosaurs. Where are they? I was in a recent debate with an atheist. He was very angry atheist, incidentally. Not all of them are. Not all of them But this man was very angry, shouting and yelling. And following up the conversation, I asked him, where did dinosaurs come from? Because I told him, I haven't found the transition. He said, they're there, man. I said, where? And here was his answer that ended the whole conversation. The whole debate was over at this point. And he knew it. He said, Mike, they're in the back rooms in the museums. What? If all these transitions are available, how support evolution? Don't you think they would put them out on display? But they weren't there. And folks, I'd love to go to the back rooms and see that claim, but great claims require real evidence. And he was unable to produce it. They don't talk about all these petroglyphs or canyon wall carvings and paintings of dinosaur creatures long before our modern scientists were putting the bones together. See, we didn't know what dinosaurs really were until the 1800s. We had found some bones, but we didn't know what they were. The word dinosaur wasn't even invented until 1841. So how did they know to draw these pictures of dinosaurs that they never saw them? They don't talk about that. We're finding soft dinosaur tissue on bones today. You can actually stretch it and it comes back together and it's elastic. You can squeeze it and squeeze out little microscopic structures, much like red blood cells. We're finding there's some multiple dinosaur bones. The only explanation we have is there's some unknown process that preserves soft tissue for 65 million years. Well, we need to get back to teaching science in the classroom. What is being taught is evolution, but not science in this issue. They talk about dating fossils and rocks. And we, we see this, this whole idea of these dating methods are very consistent. Everybody seems to come up with their exact dating methods. But when they don't tell you, every one of these radiometric dating methods is based on assumptions. Every one of them. The sad part is, I don't see that word assumption in the textbooks. That's deceiving. If we're going to teach, we need to teach science. Let our students be critical thinkers, not just tell them what to think. Let's let them figure some things out. Every one is based on assumptions. And these dating methods are not consistent at all. You can take the same rock sample dated by four different methods, come up with answers hundreds of millions of years difference. But all we seem to see is a consistent answer. Why? Because you can go into these laboratories and fill out a form beforehand and bias the whole outcome. See, people don't see things like that. There are also many, many scientific evidence that reveal a young age, far too young for evolution to occur. But they're not taught in the school systems. They're not even in the textbooks. They might be ridiculed, but they don't see them. The fact is, also, we're finding carbon-14 and coal and diamond. Folks, all the dateable carbon-14 should have decayed out of the sample specimen after about 80,000 years. There should be no dateable carbon-14 left in the specimen. So why are we finding carbon-14 in coal and diamonds? which are both organic in nature. Folks, this was not a biased experiment. This is a well-documented experiment, and it was not found in a creationist lab. The samples were taken to the evolutionist lab, and they were the ones that found the carbon-14 in every coal sample and every diamond sample taken there. Coal is supposed to be hundreds of thousands to millions of years old. It should not have carbon-14 in it. Diamonds are millions to millions of years old. They should have no carbon-14 in them. But yet there it is, again, observable and repeatable evidence that coal and diamonds, and where we found those coal and diamonds can only be thousands of years and not millions. Is that in the school books? No. Is it taught in the school books? No. Because why? We're more interested in protecting evolution than teaching science today. We talk about the evolution of man. Now, many evolved from ape like creatures over millions of years, but what they're not taught, the fossil evidence to support this is very scanty and based on a lot of speculation. There are many mistakes and frauds throughout this history. And the pictures we see in the textbooks are largely drawn by artists. For example, the picture of Lucy they put in the textbooks. Upright posture, tools, the gaze, giving it intelligence. That is 100% deception, folks. 100% deception. The fact she could stand upright is also wrong. Because when they found that pelvic bone, 
Lucy could not walk up life. Based on their presupposition that Lucy was involving human beings, they took the bones back to the laboratory, restructured them to make them look human-like. But that is not what was found. When they found that pelvic bone, Lucy walked more like an ape. They talk about how close we are to the ape-like creatures. Only 3% different in our DNA, but that is a deception. Because 3% is 90 million differences in the genome. You see, it doesn't sound so close when you put that down. So then we put the 3% down. And it's in that 3% was only part of the genome. Now that we study more of the genome, it's closer to 10 to 12%. That has not even made the textbooks yet. Textbooks are very far out of date. Why? Because they'd rather protect the teaching of evolution than good science anymore. What we're not teaching is critical thinking skills. We're not teaching things like logic or logical fallacies, how to recognize those. We're not teaching how to ask questions. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? Why? Because if our students started asking questions like that, it would cause great problems for evolution teaching. Three basic questions I teach students all the time. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? Because evolution teaching is largely based on assumptions. It is historical science. Not observed. Notice when we send our Christian students to the state run schools, they are being trained to bow down and basically honor a man who lived, died, and stayed here. Rather than Jesus Christ, fully God, who became fully man, suffered and died on that cross, was raised from the dead to live forever and ever. There's a difference. Who do we want our students to be bowing down to an honor? So, the results. George Barnett, only 3% of the nation's 13 year olds today have a biblical worldview. It's getting worse, folks. All we have to do is nothing. If we think, as Christians, this nation's bad right now, if we do nothing, it's only going to get worse. Three quarters of American 13 year olds, based on the Barnard Group study, the devil does not exist. All religion books express the same spiritual truths. Spiritual moral truth can be discovered through logic and human reason alone. Based on that, who's winning the battle? Not the churches, are they? Not the churches and not the Christian schools. Josh McDowell, the last Christian generation. Now we find that those young converts do not make it past their 18th birthday when it comes to their faith. They might do this profession of faith somewhere in the church, but before they finish school, folks, they left the church. We have a problem. So part three, how did this happen? I like strategy. How many like strategy and tactics? I also like covert operations, too. Pretty good, too. How did the takeover of the American education system take place? Because it was founded on using biblical principles. Let's go to John Dewey. Not the Dewey Decimal System, but John Dewey, the atheist and the socialist. One of the leaders in the modern progressive education system. Now, John Dewey was a very smart man, and he implemented a very good strategy. His strategy was a very good strategy. As a matter of fact, our new ministry, Grace and Training Initiative, we're using the same strategy. Nothing wrong with it. It was very good. And what was his strategy? To take control of the education system. How did he do that? He brought in like-minded people into the education or teacher colleges, who would in turn train more teachers into this particular philosophy, who would in turn go to the other schools and train the next generation into that philosophy. Now, what was John Dewey's philosophy? In the Teacher Magazine, 1933, there is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there is no need for the groups of traditional religion. With dogma and creed excluded, the immutable truth is also dead and buried. There is no room for fixed natural laws or moral absolutes. We've now gone through generations of that kind of teaching. There is a battle going on. And you look at these two castles, and you look at what we're shooting at. Abortion, racism, school violence, pornography, family breakup. Those are all good things to try to do. Those are all good things to shoot at. But where is the world shooting? At our history, our foundation. It's 
specifically the book of Genesis, which most churches don't believe. Is Genesis important? Absolutely. Out of Genesis comes the foundation for almost every one of our Christian doctrines. The first three chapters of Genesis is the reason the entire rest of the Bible had to take place. If you eliminate the historical facts of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you can no longer defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how important it is. The atheists, non-believers know full well how to fight this battle. What we need to understand is what is the foundation for every one of these, including evolutionism? It is called materialism. That again is the ideology that all that exists is mass and energy. And out of that come all these other ideals. So who understands the battle? Let me show you what the atheists know. They're much better at this battle than most churches. The atheists, 1982, they've known it for a long time how to fight the battle. And the gracious have also shown irrefutably that those liberal and new orthodox Christians who regard the gracious stories as myths or allegories are undermining the rest of Scripture. This man understands it. He knows that they don't have to directly attack the gospel because the churches would get upset about that. He knows all they have to do is attack the foundation because he knows that's where the church is weak. So he attacks the foundation. And he knows that, that if the foundation crumbles, so does the rest of Scripture. And then he goes on to say, For if there was no Adam, there was no fall. If there was no fall, there was no hell. If there was no hell, there was no need of Jesus, the second Adam, the incarnate Savior, crucified and risen. As a result, the whole biblical system of salvation collapses. And then he finishes. Evolution thus becomes the most potent weapon for destroying the Christian. Where are the churches today? John Storm, none near call it education. By the 1950s, fully 20% of all American school superintendents and 40% of all teacher college heads had received advanced degrees under Dewey at Columbia. Remember his philosophy. Abraham Lincoln. Now be careful. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln said this or not, so I'm just going to say it can be accredited to him, but I don't know where it came from, but a lot of people accredited it to Abraham Lincoln. If he did or didn't, the statement is very correct. The philosophy of the classroom in this generation will be the philosophy of politics, government, and life in the next. In other words, whoever owns the education system owns the next generation of leaders. And we can see fully well right now the next generation of leaders will not be Christian unless we do something about it. So atheist strategy, again, we need to understand strategy. If any athletes here, what do you do? <laughs> athletes. As an athlete, if you understand your opponent better and their strategy and their tactics, you have a better chance. In military, if you understand your enemy and how they fight, you'll have a better chance of survival. So we need to understand strategy and tactics. Atheist strategy. The Atheist Indoctrination Project, 2007. It seems atheists have developed a comprehensive strategy to win the minds of the next generation. How are they going to do this? The strategy we describe simply, let the religious people read them, and we will educate them to despise their parents' beliefs. In fact, it is to a large degree orchestrated by teachers and professors to promote anti and that is exactly what we see in many of our state-run schools, many of our secular universities, and unfortunately in some Christian groups also. Camps. Now we have camps, Christian camps. We have mission trips. But let me tell you what's happening, what I've seen on many of our Christian mission trips that will take place during the summer. Christian, I've been speaking to a lot of Christian camps. What happens there? I, for maybe a four-day Christian camp, I get to do maybe four lectures, each lasting about an hour long. What happens the rest of the time? It's a lot of fun and games. Nothing wrong with fun and games. But the teaching is what is kept to a minimum. 
I've talked to, I've talked to some of these uh, youth that go on a mission trip during the summer. They go on these wonderful mission trips to Mexico and other places. I start talking to them. You know what I find out? A lot of them don't know the gospel. Why are they going on what's called a Christian mission trip if they don't know the gospel? Camps. We wanted a camp not to preach there is no God, but it's a place where children can learn it's okay not to believe in God. That's the right. They can do that, can't they? We live in that kind of country where those things can take place. Here are where the Camp Quest locations are currently to be found. This is not to target anybody. I just want to show you they're very serious about what they're doing. Much more serious than what we have in the church in some cases. But it's not just a secret. These people are growing. They're well funded. Camp Inquiry, for example. New York. The camp is for ages 7 through 16. At Camp Inquiry, God takes a back seat to human reason. The thrust of the camp is to teach children to think skeptically about everything, including religion and the supernatural. But you know, the attacks also come from within the church. And those can be some of the hardest ones. Those can be some of the hardest ones. Let's take a look from within the church. There's a group out there called Biologos today. They're a group of scientists who do a lot of research, they get a lot of funding. Biologos, what they basically teach is this. Genesis 1 through 11 is not real history. They claim to be a Christian organization. There's a lot of claims about being Christian out there. But we've got to get down to the root. What is a Christian? And as a Christian, we need to accept the authority of God's word as number one. Authority of God's word. Or maybe we don't have a complete biblical worldview. Genesis 1 through 11 is not real history, is what they teach. The days of creation were long ages. You know, I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. I find zero biblical support for long ages. Death before sin. That's what they're teaching. Millions of years of death and decay before sin. They teach God proclaims death and struggle, including cancer, very good. That's what Bible teaches. That God called cancer very good. They teach the Genesis flood was only a local flood and not a worldwide flood. They teach the Ten Commandments are basically open to our interpretation. This is called a Christian organization. Now, where do we find this group? Now, Biologos, Ward College Conference, 2010, three-day program costing $325. Participants explore the compatibility of evolution and Christianity. In other words, basically what they teach is God used evolution. Folks, that is an illogical statement. Why? Because God's order of creation is the opposite of what evolution teaches. Just the opposite. And two opposites both can't be true at the same time. So it's an illogical statement. It is also saying... And think, let me ask a question. How many of you would stand before God and say, God, you got it all wrong? Because that's what we're doing when we say God used evolution. Because we're promoting man's wisdom of evolution over God's word. And saying, God, you got it wrong. Developing and marketing science for for homeschool and Christian education, teaching God used evolution. Teaching grace by evolution to Christian high school teachers in Southern California. And they paid the teachers to come to this conference. That's how well funded they are. They can pay the teachers to come to the conference and teach these teachers, Christian schools, that God used evolution and send them back to the Christian schools. This is what's happening out there. John MacArthur, in his book, Fool's Gold, makes a very good statement here. Millions in the church today are being overwhelmed by the Trojan horse boy calling for the integration of secular ideas with biblical truth. Others are easily duped by anything labeled Christian. That last sentence there was the reason Paul wrote the second letter to the Thessalonians. Because they didn't get it the first time. So we had to write two letters. The reason Paul wrote the second letter to Thessalonians, because anybody that used the name Jesus Christ, they would accept everything they said. We have an example right there in the scriptures. Be careful of people coming in, much like wolves in sheep clothing. See, the Bible does give us warnings. We see warnings all the time, that green label with the, with the sour face on it. Don't drink this, you're going to get a belly ache. Warnings, slow down, there's a curve ahead. Or warnings, don't touch this, you're going to get an amazing electrical shock. 
But the Bible also has a warning. It warns us about false teachers and false doctrines. Colossians 2.8, a warning. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There's a warning from the Bible. The Bible needs to be our authority as Christians. To have a biblical worldview. See, a biblical worldview comes right out of Matthew. Jesus said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. Everything. 2 Timothy 4, 3, 4. A warning against false doctrines coming into the church. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they eat them themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned out of favors. Be careful of people teaching in front of you. Your job is to go back and check these things out. Regardless who stands in front of you, your job is to go check these things out as the Bereans did. So part four, what's our mission? We've seen the situation, past and present. So what's our mission? The mission of every Christian, everyone who calls himself a Christian, a real Christian, has the same mission. Going therefore and teach all nations. The last words of Christ was disciples. And that word teach also means make disciples. That is the mission of every single Christian. In other words, hearing the message is not the goal. Life change is the goal. Every Christian has that as their mission. Also, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train the child the way he should go, but he's old, he will not depart. Now, I've hit the church pretty hard, and I've hit Christian schools pretty hard. But I want to make this very clear. Who is the number one teacher in the child's life? The parent, folks. Not the church, not the Christian school. We as parents and grandparents are the number one teacher in our child's life. We are responsible. Don't give that to anybody else. Let me don't send the Christian schools and churches. But whose responsibility is it ultimately? The parent. So how can this be done? Well, we need to understand what our mission is. And we need to understand how to execute that mission. Here are two organizations, Creation Training Initiative and Answers in Genesis. And there's the website you can go to. On the Answers in Genesis website, we have thousands of articles you can download for free. From the very basic to the very technical, written by many PhD scientists in their fields. All categorized. And then Creation Training Initiative. We'll talk about that in just a moment. As we get to the execution. A four-part strategic plan. Our situation. Let me sum up what our situation is here. I want to sum it up. Route number is Christian's route number. We're out finance, and we're surrounded. Sound pretty bad? It's not quite bad enough yet. There's also dissension, compromise, and surrender in the ranks. That's how you lose wars, folks. But I want to let you know something. This is what I call an opportunity. This is not a time when you sit back and say, Who are we? No! Folks, in the Marine Corps, your trade, when you're caught in an ambush, the worst thing you can do is run, retreat. You're dead. Your only hope is to go forward. Folks, in Normandy, World War II, if our soldiers had stayed on that beach and never advanced, we may have never won World War II. Their only hope of survival is to get off that beach by going forward. And we need to understand this as Christians. Yes, it looks bleak. But this is not a time to stand there and say, what was me? This is the time to go on the offense. This is the time to engage the world, not sit back and say, oh, we've lost everything. That's not what God needs. God does not need spectators. So, the war within America. I press onward, press toward, on toward the goal, the prize. In other words, folks, we win for every single church that goes back and stands on the authority of God's word. We win every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We win every time we get a Christian school to change and say, we will now stand on the authority of God's word and we're going to train our students how to defend their faith. That's when we become winners, folks. When we engage the world. And we can't do that if we don't believe it ourselves. How can we ever ask somebody else to accept Jesus Christ if we don't believe?
believe the book about him. Because the whole Bible, let me give you the theme of the Bible. Here's the theme of the Bible. Paradise created, paradise lost, paradise restored, and it all points to Jesus Christ. The entire book is about him. And if we don't believe it, then why should we ask anybody else to believe it? The war within America. So number one, strategy. We need to equip ourselves as parents. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show ourselves approved. Rightfully dividing or handling the word of God. Number two, 1 Peter 3.15 is command. To have a ready answer always for the hope that's within us. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 5. We are commanded to bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. These are biblical commands, not just to pastors. These are to all who call themselves Christians. To have a ready answer always to bring down strongholds and study the word of God. And know how to handle it and defend it. Notice, we need to be able to answer questions like this. Where did Cain get his wife? Why is that so hard? I've seen her on the History Channel twice now for a half hour. They taught the Bible as an embarrassment. And you look and see what they said. They never did their homework. They were so off track. They didn't understand genetics. Maybe they did, but they didn't want to give the truth. They didn't even understand what the Bible said. But yet millions of people saw this misinformation and believed it. So we knew how to answer those questions. How can we fit all the animals in there? Folks, it's not that hard. To answer questions like that. How do you get dinosaurs in the Bible? Was there really a worldwide flood? Folks, the geologic evidence overwhelmingly supports a worldwide flood. Does God really exist? That's a key to be a showstopper for a lot of Christians. Can you answer that question to a non-believer? Where did all the races come from? Notice I put the word races in quotes. Why? There's only one race. Only one race. It's called the human race, folks. The Bible and the book of Acts teaches we're all one blood. There's only one race. Wouldn't it be nice if our TV commentators on these new shows, including the Fox Channel, understood this? They don't seem to understand that, do they? Because they keep talking about race, playing the race card. <laughs> does the age of the earth really matter? Yes, it does. Because if, once you believe in millions of years, you can no longer defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why does God allow bad things to happen? What about Carbon 14 I can teach Carbon 14 days to a sixth grader and they can understand it. None of these does it require a degree in science. Not one of these do you have to have a degree in science to answer these. And many other ones. So number two, we need to go teachers. Christian school teachers, public school teachers, homeschool educators, even Christian teachers in public schools. Several years ago, I ran a course for Christian teachers in public schools We taught them how to teach evolution, not compromise their faith, and not lose their job. We can do things like that. That's why we bring out DVDs like apologetics to train how to answer questions. Number three, we need to equip church leaders, not just the pastor. See, the pastor's job is to get up and teach the biblical aspects of operation. Pastors aren't required to know all the science, but there should be somebody in the church that's trained to do this. Youth leaders, lay leaders, all need to know. I talk to all these youth leaders and I go to these Sunday school classes and watch. And you know what I find out? Our youth in high school don't understand the abortion issue or stem cell issue at all. What that means is we're setting them up to make a tragic mistake in their life and maybe regret the breath of their life or killing them every day. Where are our youth leaders on this? They're not being trained either. Number four, the model. Once parents, teachers, and church leaders, we get ourselves trained that we pour ourselves into the next generation. Why? Because they will be the next generation of leaders in this country. If we do nothing, guess who will be the next generation of leaders? So the model, if one person can train just three people how to teach this, just one person can train three people in a year how to teach on creation evolution, and those three in turn train three more. And those three in turn train three more. You know, at the end of 10 years, we could have thousands of people out there across this country that can teach biblical creation in Sunday school classes and Christian schools and home schools. The model is called biblical discipleship. The exact same thing Jesus Christ did in the Holocaust. 
This is not in you. This is called replication. The exact same method that John Dewey used. He did it much better than the churches did. So, our mission, our new ministry, creation training initiative, building an army of Christian educators. First part of our mission is to train others how to speak and teach on creation evolution. That's our mission. We're not going to be a big organization. Our role is to train others and send them out. Notice we're keeping to exactly what the Bible taught we're supposed to be doing. Training others how to speak and teach on God's Word. The second part of our mission is to equip the next generation to stand firm on the truth. It's called training our students how to defend their faith. Very few organizations out there are doing that today. Very few. Let me talk about some of the courses we have. We already have the one-day teacher that you're training class. I've taught this class 28 times. We've had over 1,000 people coming through this. Let me give you an idea about this class. It costs $45 to attend this class. Now, I know that sounds a lot to old school educators and Christian school teachers. You can just all make the big bucks. I know that. This is all the teams. They have all the money, don't they? No, no. In this class, you get this book. It's a 100-page book. It has all the PowerPoint slides in it, plus text besides the PowerPoint slides to help you understand what to say about the slide. Then you get a DVD with all the PowerPoint slides, just as they're used in class. And they're your PowerPoint now. You can change them to adapt to your style of teaching. Then we feed you lunch and snacks. That's pretty, that's pretty good, isn't it? Then it's already certified for one continuing education. See, we don't make a lot of money on this. The idea is to get others trained. We've already caught that many, many times. Our second course, well, we started in October. A day and a quarter, youth and youth leader defending the faith conference. Our first one will be in the area of Cincinnati, close to where I live. Defending the faith conference. Well, again, a day and a quarter. What we do in here is I teach 20 to 40 minutes on a topic. Then students, junior high, high school, college, and parents are always welcome. I never say parents can't come. That's a alarm when you say we're going to have students and parents aren't allowed. Parents are allowed. They can observe, but they don't participate because I want to see what's going on. I teach for 24 minutes, then I give the students in their small groups 10 minutes to come up with a defense on some of the things I just taught. And then I will come out and challenge these groups, and then we do a great debrief. That is what we do for a full day and a quarter. Well, this is not fluff. This is training. We're very serious about what we're doing here. So, then our next course we're going to have out is early next year, an advanced apologetics training course, focusing on a very powerful form of apologetics called presuppositional apologetics. Very powerful point there. I've already been doing teacher in service training days. I've been doing Christian schools across the country where I come in for half a day or two full days and train the Christian school teachers on how to teach apologetics and how to make Christian education the best form of education there is. And then, sometime maybe late next year, we're going to have a four-day teacher training class where we're bringing 14 teachers who want to be teachers on this subject. Fourteen. And we have two of us instructing, and we pour ourselves into those fourteen people for four days. Well, this is not fluff. Because you'll have to have prerequisites before you can get in there. Once you're in there, you'll be taking written exams. You'll have to do short presentations. We'll grade you on your knowledge and your communication skills. There is no such thing as boring or monotonous. We want good communication skills in there. And then we're going to throw you up front of us. We're going to throw questions at you and help you understand how to answer questions. Whether they're nice questions or attack questions, you need to know how to do this. This is what we call training. Then hopefully in a year or two, we'll have what's called a seven-day youth apologetics college where we bring high schoolers in and for seven days we will train them on how to defend your faith in God's Word. And the first place we have to start, and we do this in a day and quarter class for you, is how to present the gospel. I need to make sure we know the gospel before we go any further. This is the things we're doing at Creation Training Initiative. We just started in February. If you need more information, here's our website. We have forms out there. Feel free to pick up these forms. If you want to help support our ministry, this all takes financing too. It doesn't happen for free. But it does take financing. If you want to help support what we're trying to do here, this educational movement, we have the forms out there where you can do that. Building an army of Christian educators. 
Now, I am tired, and some of you may be too, of seeing our students enter the public schools of Christian students and become the casualties. Would it be nice if they could walk into these classrooms and be the influencers? We have seen this done before in training. Would it be nice if they could walk into that classroom and knew how to ask the right science questions? They knew how to respond. And they knew how to be critical thinking. And they knew how to write their reports on evolution, keeping to what the teacher says and not compromise. This can be done. We can train our students to be the influencers, the good students, and not the casualties. And we can stop losing over 7% in the school systems. That's why we started the creation training edition of Ever this year. After many years of study and watching other groups of studies, we decided it's time to do something. We need to take the next step in the creation. We've been going for many, many years, going all the way back to Henry Morris, John Whitman, and many people before that. But we need to take the next step in the research. Are we willing? to start training our students and ourselves. If I have a question. Because there's this, this logic that's called equivocation. 
using the same word to mean more than one thing in the same sentence. What do you mean by evolution? You must understand the definitions that are being used in discussion. And some people call this thing called microevolution, which is really variety with the kind. Yes, we believe that. It's observable. If that's part of their definition, yes, we believe in that. But on the other side, the macroevolution, where one kind completely evolves into another new kind, no, I don't. So you have to understand the definition of what you're talking about. Be careful, loaded questions. Stem cell. I am against embryonic stem cell research. Why? It doesn't work. It, in all the years they've been using this and working on it, it's been used to heal or treat zero diseases and disorders, folks. Anybody know how much zero is? Zero. And it has a great tendency to grow tumors, cancer. And you may be on drug treatments the rest of your life because of tissue rejection, because it requires a donor. The FDA has just allowed use of embryonic stem cells for a test project in this country. I know in Israel they've used embryonic stem cells on one patient. The man now has cancer directly related to the embryonic stem cells they received. What they're doing in this country, the FDA approved it for some blind patients to use embryonic stem cells not to cure their blindness. It had nothing to do with curing their blindness. It had to do with experimentation to see if they were safe or not. Folks, that goes back to the Nazi Germany days of 30s and 40s. Because that's exactly what they did. The FDA is now approved. But I am for the adult stem cell research. Why? Because it does not involve the destruction of a human embryo. Embryonic stem cell research is another form of abortion, folks. Plain simple, it's another form of abortion. Adult stem cells you can get from your body. Bereaved. See, embryonic stem cells you can only harvest from around day 5 up to about somewhere around day 10 or 12, right in there. It's the only time you can harvest embryonic stem cells, around day 5 or around day 12. But the adult stem cells you can harvest the rest of your life, and they are not embryos, do not involve the destruction of the human birth. Today, they've been used to heal or treat over 80 different diseases and disorders, and they do work. But we have to be careful. We're using them, and sometimes we don't know what's really happening. We're just on the forefront of this stem cell research. And now we have other means. We don't even need to do this. Because now we can take normal skin cells, reprogram them to have all the capabilities of an embryonic stem cell but not be an embryo. Wow. I tell you, genetics is an amazing field to go into. I encourage people to go into genetics. Yeah.
So we have, not only, we have a DVD dinosaurs for children and big children from about my age too. And we have another one, what I call four power questions to ask a non-believer that they cannot answer based on any observable science. I explain the answer, I explain the responses that can be given, and then I show you how to take the discussion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's not our wisdom comes. It's not a matter of our wisdom. It's a matter of the word of God that's important. And that's what we're going to do. I'll leave it there tonight. If you have questions, again, we have forms out there to fill out. We have a, a newsletter, an electronic newsletter you can sign up for. And I want to thank you very, very much for coming out this evening and giving up some of your time to, to listen to the old question. Thank you and God bless you.